Mateo. Doc, how are we doing? We're doing well. How are you? Doing great. Uh, today, I just finished a book a couple of days ago, uh, gifted to me from our mutual friend, Ross, called Raising Outdoor Kids in an Indoor World, written by Steve Ranella. You how know is Steve it? Ranella, the meat eater? Absolutely. Uh, it was good. Steve does a great job of being outside. Obviously, his his job is to run a, a media company around. I guess it's would you say it's like acquiring wild food. This guy goes on hunting and fishing and foraging trips. Uh, it seems like for a living. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me, how long is this book before you dive into it? Short. So for my own. Beautiful. I mean, that's, I only read short books. <laughs> that's um. That sounds like a, a timely book for me to read, you know, as my daughter's getting older and I have the second one here. Yeah. Uh, well, that's why, that's why Ross had gifted it to me. Uh, because I think in the world, we're seeing more and more people become inside screen obsessed. Uh, I think society in general is moving in that direction. So Steve makes an argument for why it's important to get your kids outside Mm -hmm. And a lot, the early part of the book, he's explaining how it shouldn't be intimidating. It's easier than you think. And there's a lot of options to do it. And then the second half, or maybe the second 70% is all around strategies to, you know, get kids outside. And so I've taken his, his points and I've devised somewhat of a plan that I'll share with you and get your feedback on. But nice. Yeah. So, I mean, first he, he mentions that you can, you know, take kids outside to do anything. Even if you live in, he lived in downtown Seattle. He lived in down, or just outside of Seattle. He lived in Brooklyn. Uh, he now lives in, in Montana and he grew up uh, on a lake in Michigan. Mm -hmm. So he's kind of bookended his life with two really outdoor settings, but he's lived in the city for, I don't know, he's probably like 45 years old. Um, so a good chunk of his life has been, you know, he spent living in cities and not necessarily right on the edge of the woods where you would think every hunter and, and that kind of person would live, right? So, uh, you know, he encourages people to go camping and do all the normal things that you would, you would assume an outdoor family would do. And then he breaks up. Well, first, let me go back to saying, I, I really admire, I think you've done a very good job of centering a lot of family time around the kitchen and around food. And you guys mm -hmm. have the motto in your house, ABC, always be cooking. Every time I talk to you, at least you, usually you and your wife are in the kitchen. There's pans clanking, there's things being stirred. Uh, and I think it's a, and in our house too, it's a really great way. People like to gather around food, right? And usually okay. when the food is good, people aren't complaining. Mm -hmm. So I've taken Steve's, uh, some of Steve's advice and formulated this plan that I want to share with you around how I'm going to not only get my family and spend more time outdoors, but center it around food. And then there's this whole other idea of us connecting with our food sources and, and knowing more about mm -hmm. our food. And I think if you can enrich the mealtime experience as much as possible, there's so much more joy that comes just as collateral damage with that. You know, you're spending time together cooking. You have this connection to your food. You have this experience together where you're gathering this food. You have more of a connection and, and knowing to where, where it came from and uh, the sacrifice a lot of times that's involved in that. So there's all these different pieces that uh, Steve ties together in the book. And it's inspired me to – I'm going to obviously have to start slower because – my son just turned six months yesterday, two days ago, and mm -hmm. some things he's not going to be able to do just quite yet. But there's four big buckets that Steve, you know, encourages you to explore beyond the normal, you know, go outside, go camping and, and those normal things. And, and he does, you know, makes it really clear that when you take kids outside, they entertain themselves pretty easily. He has this place, 
like a family fishing cabin that he bought. It's this old kind of rickety cabin he bought on the water in Sitka, Alaska. I think it's in Sitka. And he said, you can let the kids go out in these tide pools and they'll be out there for five hours entertaining themselves, just flipping over rocks, climbing around, throwing stuff. You know, it's just kids will entertain themselves if given the opportunity outdoors. We often don't give them that opportunity. So they end up wanting to entertain themselves with an iPad, right? Mm -hmm. So Steve's recommendations, it, well, he, he proposes a few different kind of domains or, or, or like big, you know, uh, ideas, and then you can iterate within those ideas. So the first one is easy. It's gardening. And you can, you know, build a garden. I'm going to build a, uh, I've had big elaborate gardens in the past when I lived outside of town, but I'm going to this weekend build an above ground garden bed, something, you know, relatively simple, two feet by 16 feet. And, uh, you know, that's an opportunity to just grow some stuff, we can all kind of interact with it and play a part in it. And great. Gardening's pretty straightforward. His okay. second one is foraging. And so it's really interesting. I just listened to a podcast in Central Oregon. There is a really big community of people that forage for morels and chanterelles. I think I'm, mm -hmm. I think those are the two. So my well, this plan that I have is that I want to organize a an event, four events a year, where the family goes on some kind of food gathering trip together. One, it's a way to spend time outside. And two, you're going to get to connect with your food. Three, you're going to get food that you would normally, you know, if I'm going to buy X from the grocery store, I can go get it and it, I'll just have more of an experience around it. I'll have more of a connection to it, I'll, you know, and we'll have a better, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a better understanding of where it came from. So I figured, okay, gardening, that's easy. This uh, foraging trip is easy. It's going to be, you know, especially with a little one, you can just go walk around in the woods. And there's actually a couple here that takes people who are new to it, like me, uh, out into the woods. And, and it helps you understand how to find these things, almost like a guided foraging trip for these morels and chanterelles. The third trip I want to take is going to be all around, and this is, you know, I'm in the Pacific Northwest. It's different in every region, right? Mm -hmm. um, but the third trip, my neighbor was just telling me about this the other day, is he takes a uh, – him and his family go up to Alaska for a week. They do five days on a boat, and they <clears throat> do, like, crabbing, shrimping, fishing for halibut, fishing for rockfish, and fishing for salmon. And – damn. Uh, wildlife is abundant in Alaska, more so than it is in, in the lower 48. But he said, you know, they spend a ton of time sort of gathering all of this. And then they process it, clean it all, vacuum seal it, and then they ship it all home. And he said, so we have a year's worth of, you know, shrimp, crab, salmon, halibut, rockfish, you name it. I thought, oh, what a really fun way to go spend a week with the family up in Alaska. But then you also get this really high quality fish as well. It's kind of killing two birds with one stone. And then you sit down to eat and you have something to talk about. Oh, remember this that happened when we were doing, you know, when we were pulling up the shrimp pods or whatever it is. So that was number three. And number four okay. is naturally the X Games of it all, the, the most intense version, but that's a hunting trip. And I think that could be... It can go in a few different ways. Here in Central Oregon, we have really great bird hunting, like uh, duck hunting, and then upland games. So um, quail, pheasant, um, chucker, stuff like that. So those are really easy, like local kind of, you know, things you could do right away. Um, and then on top of that, I obviously want to do uh, the longer, more extended, you know, not just a day trip, but spend a week outside uh, on an actual, you know, big game hunt, whether that's, you know, elk, deer, hogs, etc. So I've been inspired. I've been talking to my wife about, all right, let's get these four different trips booked per year. It's a mm -hmm. great way to spend time outside. We also go to great lengths to, you know, have a, a high quality 
food in our in our home. A lot of it comes from all of our meat comes from a farm that we know or have been to. Um, I mean, even our dog food. I just got a delivery from one of our local farmer friends that delivers all their scrap meat, and we make dog food out of it. And uh, so I think it kills a lot of birds with with one proverbial stone. And it's doing our grocery shopping in a more intentional and more experienced, rich way. And I think it's going to help my son to realize, and it's something that I didn't even realize until probably my 20s, that when you're eating a piece of meat, something died. That's a a dead thing you're eating. And something Mm -hmm. is, there's this like cycle where things are losing energy in order to give something else energy. And I still haven't fully come to terms with that. I have a friend here, Billy. She's an older woman. She owns uh, Windy Acres Farms. And she texted me a couple nights ago and said, hey, we're going to slaughter hogs this week. Do you want to come out and help? And I thought, no, absolutely not. I hate killing things. I don't want to see things die. I just it's, it's emotional for me. I don't like it. And she does really humane on-farm slaughter, literally has uh, someone come out and shoot these animals with a 22, like headshots. So it's as good, I think, as it gets for an animal like that, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But I think it's good to, just because you're not aware of it and not confronting it and not facing it directly doesn't mean that it's not happening. And I think it's good to challenge yourself and to have the awareness and, and maybe even to feel that little bit of pain, a little bit of suffering, a little bit of discomfort around seeing something die and knowing that something dies, something is giving its life for your life. And I think it builds a little bit more, maybe more of a sense of appreciation. It maybe gives a higher vibration to the experience of eating. And I think it's ultimately a really great way to enrich your life, your family's lives, your kids' lives, even though it's a little bit painful up front. Because I, I love the idea of hunting. I love going hunting. The irony of it is, is that I hate killing things. Uh, even fishing. I don't want to kill fish. I'm, most 99% of the fishing I've done has been catch and release fly fishing. Uh, so, yeah, something that we're working on logistically, putting into, uh, into practice and something I'm excited about. It's beautiful. So are there any other recommendations from the book on spending time outdoors that are not around food. I'm just curious. Yeah. So there's the camping and hiking and all the normal things that are really easy to do. It's a matter of doing it usually, you know, Hmm. anytime parents are saying, Oh, you know, my kids don't spend enough time outside, but I mean, kids are normally going to do what mom and dad lead them to do. And if mom and dad throw them in the car at 7 a.m. to go hike, you know, on a three-hour hike on on Saturday morning, that's what they're going to do. And they're going to have a hell of a time sitting on an iPad when you're, you know, at 5,000 feet, two hours into a hike. So a lot of it is setting them up for success. For sure. Well, I think in general, we are, we as people, you know, as, as humans, as creatures, as animals, we enjoy being outdoors because that's where we come from. That's what we are. And being, and we talked about the comfort crisis, you know, being indoors and being on iPads as much as those are designed to hit our dopamine levels and give us some sort of a reward is not as rewarding. It does not feel as good uh, energetically, you know, and physically as being outside. So naturally, and let's say, as you're saying, if setting up the scene before a child would receive an iPad or a game or, or let's say, a TV show or a movie that has all kinds of moving effects that hit the dopamine uh, receptors, I think, in general, my, my daughter wants to spend more time outside, period. Like, she, she, you know, we don't spend as much time indoors. We don't have a TV. Uh, so she doesn't even have those ideas, really. You know, she watched Total, you know, in four years. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, maybe 24 hours of TV in her life. Um, you know, she goes to some other friend's house and let's say one of their, I remember like we walked in and one of their daughters were, was watching TV that, um, uh, my daughter came to play with and she was just like, you know, staring yeah. at the movie. And my, my daughter's like looking at this for a second. She's like, all right, let's, let's do something, you know, she, but, and also different, I know that different 
people and different beings have different energetics. You know, she, my daughter definitely likes to be moving around and using her body to express herself. And, um, she's, she could play with little rocks, you know, in our driveway for hours, you know, just stacking them, putting them in her shoe and throwing them and, and all that, which is by itself, just, a. uh, I think a great measure to, to show how we enjoy being outside and entertain ourselves being outside very easily with nature, um, rather than the, the more synthetic experience that we have indoors, which serves its purpose. Um, you know, we talked about this before in the podcast, um, uh, just like we're recording right now with a computer and there's a lot of joy from using a computer and, and watching, uh, let's say YouTube videos, perhaps on a bigger screen and whatnot and educational stuff and entertainment, like there, there's a place for all of that, but, um, yeah, I think it's it's interesting that now we need books on strategies on how to go outside because we become so addicted to the indoor lifestyle. Uh, and so, so much of that comfort crisis, really touching and, and connecting those two dots there. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's, a, it's a crisis to the point that now we need another book, not only telling us there's a crisis, also here's how to get out of the crisis. And here are some strategies, as you're saying, like you were saying, like, oh, the, all the normal stuff, and perhaps we even need to list it out, like, to remind people about hiking and camping and just walking out and, and what people call forest bathing. I just took a morning walk today, nothing fancy, like 15 minutes outside, backward walking, just hearing the birds chirping, looking at the lake, nothing, nothing too fancy, like nothing crazy. And it felt fantastic. And a lot of times maybe I'm rushing to get some stuff done that generates income or makes me feel more accomplished, whether that's recording a podcast, preparing for a podcast. Um, or, you know, talking to a client or whatever, you know, reading a book and even reading, I think even reading a book. So like reading a book to our children, you know, we, and making it a point, let's say when it's nicer outside, whether that's spring or summertime or fall, uh, and sitting outside in, in a sunroom or on a bench or on the grass, um, you know, or going to some sort of a food truck venue or something and eating outside. Um, a lot of times when it's nice out. But my wife and I will take our camping chairs and we'll just sit outside in the driveway. Uh, and Sadhguru says, just sitting under a tree, you know, taking in just the fresh air and, and spending some time there and getting some sunlight. And it feels amazing. Uh, it feels definitely much better than sitting at the kitchen table inside um, in forced air or in air conditioning. So it's interesting. And um, I think us as humans, we get pretty, and I'm going to use the word addicted. We get addicted. We just get comfortable and we get, we like the, the known, uh, things that we're used to. So we get used to and adapt to things pretty quickly. And then we are sometimes reluctant to change, uh, our habits, you know? Um, and that's something actually that I've been doing lately is, uh, or our patterns, you know, I've been breaking my patterns on purpose to bring in more new things in my life. And I reached out to one of my good friends, who is huge into fly fishing. And, um, I, I, really, I mean, I don't think I've even been fly fishing before. Uh, you know, I know a little bit about it. I went practicing at those pools a little bit, maybe once. Um, and I did go out and like spend some time, but I didn't do the act of fly fishing myself. And he got a, a little boat here, um, Chattahoochee river around Atlanta area. Um, so I reached out to him since the weather is nicer. It's like 70 degrees tomorrow, but he's like, Oh, I'm a weekend warrior these days. So, but you know, I mean, the the craving to be outside, especially when it goes from cold weather to nice, you know, to warmer weather, it's just like let's fucking do it. And a lot of times, I think there's going to be a bigger bang on the buck on the time we're going to spend inside to be productive, to you know, do something creative and productive for work or whatnot, because we've been recharged and we are feel more balanced, we feel more whole, you know, from. Uh, doing, doing what we're, where we came from and being where we came from, um, in that way, you know, with the elements. Yeah. I think dude, another, it's hard also to motivate yourself to go. Yeah. Outside is naturally more comfortable. It's going to be or uncomfortable. You know, you're usually less comfortable than sitting on a couch or a nice chair, you know, that I'm on right now. Uh, you're not temperature controlled. So it's, it's harder to motivate yourself to do that when you're already comfortable so I think scheduling something in saying, Hey, on Friday morning at nine, we're leaving and here's the, the hike on all trails that we're going to do and having things booked in advance. So you know that you're going to do them. No one's ever gone on a, you know, a, a couple hour hike and felt 
upset that they did it and then like, oh shit, I, I wish I didn't do that. So, you know, I, I think it's more about being intentional. And the other side is people always want to complain about kids these days. Kids these days, they want to, you know, they're always on their phone. They're always on their iPad most kids aren't, the kids we're talking about aren't driving a car. They're not creating the schedule. They're sort of along for the ride, right? Your kids are along for the ride and they're living out life sort of on this road. Maybe they're picking the lane, but you've given a road that they're going to kind of live within. So most of the responsibility is on the parents. Set them up. If you want your kids to spend more time outdoors, it's up to you. Get them outdoors. Make Make commitments plan things that are outside and it's free. It's, there's no, there's really no reason to not do it. Yeah. And it's interesting how you said kids these days, I'm like, who created those kids, you know, created quite literally physically and created in a way of emotionally, psychologically, you know, habitually, we are creating our kids and especially as they are in their initial years. And they're very much going from, you know, the lower brain waves, to the higher brain waves, the only rich, I think beta, brain waves, which is what adults, uh, you know, like the conversation we're having right now with those waves at age 12, I think. Um, so there's a lot of time to really program our kids because they, they really soak everything like a sponge. Uh, as we know, kids are more uh, capable of absorbing and learning languages and, and a lot of other things. They are recording what we're doing. So when we say kids these days, we're saying us as a society as a whole, you know, we're not saying, uh, oh, this you know, this guy's kids, like only them or, or just this community, you know, um, it's, it's a, it's a collective thing that, um, uh, we're doing. It's, it's us ourselves, you know, it's, it's a reflection of how we're living as a society. And then if we are in a, in a, in a time where we have books that come out about the comfort crisis and how to raise kids in a, in a, in a wilder environment, then that means that the majority of us are not doing that because we need, uh, to break the patterns that we have been doing uh, by using technology, by using the synthetic environments that we built for ourselves. Yeah. 100%. I do. Something came to mind when you were telling me about the fishing trip and I, I just want to challenge it just for, from a, you know, from a holistic health uh, perspective there. So first thing first I want to touch on is that I've heard recently that I know what you're going to say already. <laughs> no, no, no. So, so, so two things I'm, I'm going to start with a, but the one that I think is less known at first, I've heard that shrimp is the cockroaches of the ocean. For uh, sure. And that like put me off. And I'm like, I don't really want to eat shrimp since, since then. Cause I don't want to, I'm not really buying into the insects. Uh, you know, what we call this, uh, nutrient density or, or consciousness that I want to be bringing into my, to my body. What's, what's your take on that? How about lobster? So what, what, so what is a lobster? Like a big, a big ass cockroach? What is it? It's a big shrimp. I mean, I think cockroach has a negative connotation to it. Well, I don't we know. Have, I'm sure there's in, information. Think, there's an innate feeling that people have towards cockroaches for sure. Um, I think there's there's some sort of an uh, aversion and um, uh, disgust towards the type of, of creature for a reason. Um I'm not as disgusted by them as, as my wife by any means, but I can see even, you know, my daughter, not as my, as much as my wife, perhaps she's also picking up on my wife's energy, but people are usually not thinking like, Oh man, I got a cockroach in my house. Like let's catch that thing and, and, and put it in the stove, you know? Um, so what's, what, what makes us want to put those pots, let's say to get, you know, in the ocean or the, the nets to get a lot of shrimp. Uh, that's just, I mean, curiosity, because uh, I just heard this new thing about shrimp and I never even had that in my mind. My, my intuition is, is that they're kind of like little bugs, you know, in the ocean, uh, you know, they're bigger than plankton, but they're, it's like a small, it, it can be compared to, I'm, I'm not sure how they drew that comparison. I've heard it as well. I think cockroaches are gross because they usually, usually are living in dumpsters and shit. They live in gross places and they eat gross things. <laughs> The ocean doesn't have dumpsters. All right, let me let me show you this visual here quickly. All right, let me see. Uh, let me see what you think you're about ruin, this one. You're ruin shrimp for me right now. I mean, that's that's what I was telling my wife the other day that shrimp is ruined for me. And let me see what you think about this one. All right, do so I I'm want to see open this? up this. Yeah, I mean, let's just do a little comparison quickly. 
So share um, tab, I think it's uh, this one right here. So let's take a look at that. So what do you think about this? Did you know that shrimp are the roaches in the ocean? Shrimp are commonly known as sea cockroaches for their omnivorous food type. An example, feeding sea trash, just like the cockroaches. Let me see. I need to move my screen a little bit. Um, cockroaches feeding on the earth's trash. Think about this next time you eat shrimp. And they, they, they show the images here with the comparisons of, you know, very similar structure. What do you think? This person is an asshole. First of all, that makes no sense at all. The ocean's trash is way different than, I mean, you're talking ocean trash is organic matter that's been moved through whales and it, it, this totally different than what you find in a back alley of New York City where cockroaches are feeding. <laughs> I hate this well, comparison. Dude. Well, here's it's the horrible. thing. I'm, I'm, li I'm living in the woods, you know, in, in Georgia and there are cockroaches here. They're not having the same diet as uh, the cockroaches in, in a big city. Eat them up. Here's the thing. Here, here's the thing. Here's the thing. The ocean's already dirty. Is, is, is I mean, I don't know how dirty they are, but I mean, they're, they're plastics and microplastics. I mean, people, humans have been trashing the oceans. There's a glyphosate city, you know, in the ocean. I mean, it's just, it's just a thing, you know, just a little point of uh, contemplation there. So you could say that about anything. I mean, they just did a test on caribou meat in the poles, which you would think, oh, I shot a caribou you know, in the Arctic, this has got to be the most pure, beautiful, untouched, never seen a human before in its life. The thing is, is a lot of that, all those agricultural chemicals evaporate at the equator, move to the poles in the water system. It condenses there and rains down. So some of those, the meat in these most remote places on earth is actually the most toxic glyphosate rich, metal rich and contaminated Damn. meat on earth. I mean, this is an ecosystem issue. I don't think you're going to get away from that. I don't think the oceans, and this is, I'd like to put the caveat out there. I have no idea what I'm talking about. I'm 80% full of shit. This is all my, uh, you know, my unsound and anecdotal logic here, but I think you're going to well, have you've heard, you've, stuff anywhere. Yeah. You've heard a few things. You have some common sense when you're making these statements. Yeah. Let me ask you about the fish. What other fish did you say you, uh, uh you want to get in on let's because I'm, you know, the latest thing that I'm, that I'm really paying more attention to is the size of the fish. It's not even about like the type, the type, I mean, yes, there's swordfish, there's all kinds of fish that we know are higher in heavy metals as is, but also if we, if, even if we compare, uh, king salmon to coho salmon by the sheer size and in, in the, where the depth of, you know, of the water is that the fish hangs out, the more fish they eat, the more they, they hold into heavy metals. And I've been sure. a bit more, um, Careful to eat smaller fish as, as a meaning. I am making salmon tonight. <laughs> I've been working with this lemon preserve for a little bit. It's coho salmon. Um, but yeah, what's, what's your take on, on size of the fish and, and choosing fish based on their size? Based on what I know, it's the bioaccumulation. So little fish has a little bit of mercury, bigger fish eats that it has the mercury, its own mercury plus right. the little fish, the bigger fish eats that it's, you know, it kind of keeps multiplying. Mm -hmm. That's why swordfish is no good. That's the general rule of thumb. I think we don't eat fish more than once a week at the most anyway. So mm -hmm. I'm not super worried about it. Shrimp are again, not predatory. I would imagine that their mercury and toxin levels are, are pretty low from a, a, or they're carnivorous, I guess it said on that. Mm -hmm. They're very small. I, I worry much less about that. Uh, halibut are bottom feeders. So yeah, there's probably, I think rockfish, something similar. Um, again, I just don't worry about it because we're not, if I was living on this stuff, I'd maybe be concerned, but if I'm eating fish once a week and you know, it just, it just doesn't scare me. I'm getting in the sauna and I'm, you know, drinking plenty of water and doing all the other things. It doesn't scare me all that much. And you know, there's the other side of it where you could do, okay, maybe it doesn't have to be that. Maybe I can go up to the, the, the coast here in the Pacific Northwest and do some clamming. There's a lot of, you can go gather. I think you can get like 26 clams a day or something per licensed fisherman. Mm -hmm. uh, there's all the shellfish stuff you can do. There's the local fish in all the rivers here in, um, in, the, in the Northwest, which are freshwater 
I mean, again, there's probably going to be, you know, I think there's mining issues too and agricultural runoff. And I mean, yeah, you're going to be, I know that's a big thing with salmon is the pebble mining. They have metals uh, really in the fish what's, from Alaska. Yeah. What's your take on uh, tuna? Do you, do you mess with tuna? No, I don't. Uh, one, I'm just kind of over it, but I'll eat it every now and then if it's, uh, you know, like maybe we're leaving for a trip and there's, we've kind of like worked through the fridge and there's nothing. And, and I'm in this situation where I go, like, oh, I want to, I need to eat something for lunch today. We're not going to be shopping today. Uh, I'll, I'll eat like a little jar of that wild planet, like in the glass jars, tuna. Mm -hmm. Again, that's a few times a year. Do you think there's any benefit of taking uh, activated charcoal right before eating fish or uh, say zeolite or something? in conjunction to min to help, you know, bind the toxins and flush them out of the system. I've heard so much about that. You would probably know more than me on that. I've heard that activated charcoal is pretty tough to actually do anything. And maybe it does if you, if you like drink it while you're eating. Um, mm -hmm. But I've heard it does a pretty bad job of pulling stuff out of the tissues. Uh, I've also heard issues with the zeolite, not or with having yeah. issues with reabsorption. Um, you know, not, not like pull it out of the tissues, but you're not getting it out of you. Uh, and mm -hmm. I've also heard, I think, oh, this is actually on a Luke story, recent episode with, I keep wanting to say Dr. Chris Shade, but he's this Quicksilver scientific guy. Oh, Dr. Pompa talks about mm. uh, detox and how most detox products are actually like the, the clays that, I think it's zeolite or montmorillonite clay. Okay. actually has a lot of metals in it and the way it's mined and processed yeah. can actually be more toxic than what it's pulling out. So yeah, activated charcoal. Maybe if you're going to eat some tuna, drink some activated charcoal or take a couple of capsules when you're doing it, but I don't do it that much to, for it to matter. I got you. Well, a, a friend of ours, Thaddeus takes activated charcoal before he goes he, uh, to a sushi restaurant or something. I remember oh, when really? he did it when he was uh, when he was visiting me. So I'm gonna ask him when I see him in a couple of weeks. Uh, what's his take on it? But I, you know, I just have a pump of the uh, is it symb symbiotica or symbiotica, which mm -hmm. is delicious. Has some other uh, I don't know some other compounds in there that make it more absorbable, more bioavailable. I, I just wonder if it's uh, you know if it helps with that. But I know I've heard of activated charcoal kind of picking up a toxin and then it, it is another toxin, so it, it drops off this one and then it's recirculating. So yeah, that's that's part of the conversation you'll hear in uh, seeking optimization. <laughs> we are yeah. seeking. Yeah, I mean all this stuff exists on a spectrum, and yeah, I would love to be uh, you know hunting for all of my meat at some point. But I think one step closer to that is just going to a local farm and it's pretty easy and it's, it's really great for them. They love it. You're supporting a business. That's, you know, it's a small business that requires people like us to, to go support them. You're getting usually a better price, a better quality of meat, a fresher product. You're going to have more connection to it when you're eating it. I've never had it not taste better than something I get at whole foods or whatever. Uh, it's kind of a no-brainer. So even if it's one step in the direction of getting closer to your food, is just finding a, a local farm where you can go buy from them direct. It's great for their business. It's great for you. I can't find a reason it wouldn't. You wouldn't do it. Because there's one more topic I want to uh, unpack in here, and that's the the killing of uh, you know sentient beings in in order to you know take take the energy right and, and utilize that energy into our environment. You know our being. So I've had some you know thoughts on on let's say eating more vegetables or fruit and you know we, we've had a conversation a bunch of times you know that's i think a lot of people are vegetarians or they're pescatarians or they're vegan for those reasons that they do not want to kill an animal because it you know perhaps it's a more it's more perhaps it has a higher level of consciousness than 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 uh than lettuce you know or a carrot perhaps we don't even know if that's the case uh, it seems to be more more conscious because it has eyes and you know, it's, a, it's able to move and, and we feel its emotions. Um, perhaps we're vibrating more on that on that level. And perhaps the vegetables, as I've heard from other uh, vegans and, and, and vegetarians, those are vibrating at a higher level that we're not even able to, to tap into. And then there's, of course, the farming and all the insects um, and all the other conscious 
lives that, that get destroyed and, and killed in the process of harvesting those vegetables. So what's really, what's, what's the take there? Like, even if we take, um, you know, a piece of fruit from, from a tree, is that, is that fruit dead as, as soon as we pull it from the branch? Um, what's, what's going on in here? Well, the fruit is sweet because it wants the, that's the tree's strategy to bring something in, to eat it, to take the seed and disperse it. A tree can't throw its seed. Well, some use wind as a pollination to move its seed, but fruit is sweet mm -hmm. in order to attract something to eat it, to bring the seed, right? That's their mm -hmm. reproduction strategy. Yep. I, I have a hard time buying the ethical. It's, it's just being unhappy with the way things are. And there's this weird line in the sand that people draw when they say, oh, you know, you're killing something for your own benefit. Well, well, because the thing that I'm killing is bigger than the thing that you're killing. Let me tell you, if you're eating a carrot, there are things, not even in the agricultural sense, because go visit a, a uh, you know, um, what's the, the place there in Central California where almost all the carrots come from? Um, Bolt House, I think it is. That's mm -hmm. a... It's a slaughterhouse of everything except mammals, you know, and even some mammals. It's things are just dying left and right in the most organic production ever. So anyone who tells me that they're, you know, they're buying a bag of organic carrots at the store and thinks they're saving, they're killing way more animals than you are by putting an arrow in an elk. But. And, and what animals are those? I mean, insects? rabbits, gophers, insects, uh, I mean, even if someone is eating only bread, the amount of deer fawns and, and like small mammals that are getting ripped up in grain combines. I mean, if you're out, you know, harvesting your rice by hand and processing it, like, good on you. But I guarantee you, anyone who's bitching about people killing animals on the internet is not doing that. What what, what happens in that process? Did they take machines and, and bunnies and, and golfers and such get, they get caught up in the machine while they're... Uh, uh, yeah, chomping 100%. on a carrot. Yeah, okay. watch it, watch. Yeah, and and I mean, these are commercial enterprises. It, it, any any ground where they're growing food, there's going to be tons of gophers, and they're going to be trapping and poisoning ground animals, ground squirrels, gophers, rabbits. Uh, they put out bait bowls for coyotes because the coyotes come in because they're irrigating, and that's where the water is. It, 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 at the end of the day, things are dying, and if we take farming aside. And someone says, oh, I'm eating only the most natural. It requires things to die in order for other things to live. And I see that on a hierarchy. Bacteria are dying in order to provide fertility in soil for a plant to grow. Something is dying mm -hmm. so the plant can grow. And then that plant is going to die in consumption by a mammal so that that mammal can grow. And then the things at the top, high end of the food train, whether it's you or a wolf or a, a bear, are dying or eating something that's alive. And then we die and decompose and become bacteria and become fertile soil for something else to grow. Anyone who's saying that there's something wrong in this system is just uncomfortable with the way things are. In my opinion. Yeah, and, and Again, you know, could be totally wrong. And it, What's interesting to me is that, you know, we have the we have the the concept of dying as, um, let's say, something stops to to work in that body, whether that's a, a person's heart, or you know, a bunny's heart, or, or whatever that might be. Uh, of course, that thing is still has a lot of life, life force energy as it's being consumed by another uh, person or animal, right? So if a coyote is eating, um, you know, a deer, or a person is eating a deer. There's still a ton of life force energy that perhaps the soul of the of the deer is not there anymore. Perhaps the soul of the deer is hanging out. I mean, but that life force energy, there's no energy does not go and dissipate into nothingness. It just doesn't poof and disappear. It is it only moves from A to B to C to D, you know, and it keeps moving and moving just like we are in our bodies. You know, things keep uh, uh, you know recirculating in in this existence. So, you know, in general, as you're saying from from my perspective, at least, um, whether it has to do with uh, the bacteria or the smaller animals and moving up in the in the hierarchy uh, of, of what's going on in the world, it's just the energy is just moving on to another another area, perhaps. And that's how I see a lot of the animals that I'm consuming and, and the food that I'm consuming. I'm 
first, I'm, I'm in reverend, and I think as you're saying, the more we go and connect uh, and, and, and take the lives ourselves, right, and see how those lives stop and then become us, right? You are what you eat. Uh, have more reverend for the life force energy that you're consuming and that you're harvesting in, in whatever way. And then also having the reverend that we are merging our consciousness together for, it goes, uh, it goes bi-directional. You know, we are taking the consciousness, let's say, of, of a duck and also the duck now gets to live in our community of trillions of sales and experience what it's like to look into a, a webcam and, and talk through a microphone. And before then they were flipping uh, and flapping their wings in a, in a lake, you know, and I'm not saying one is better than the other, but for, for whatever reason, that's, that's how things work um, and have been working for a long time. If anybody's interested in, in, in eating uh, beyond meat food or, um, you know, lab grown food and, and all that. I mean, I, I highly respect that. And I think they, you know, they should definitely do what their intuition tells them to do. I think from what we've seen with research and, and the effects that it has on the body, on the physical body, emotional body, mental body, all that, um, those synthetic, once again, we get back to synthetic versus natural, uh, compounds and, and products are not as healthy for nature. We are nature. It seems like eating a beyond, meat burger, I can't remember what the ingredients are in there, based on the science, based on the research, is not as healthy as eating uh, a grass-fed, grass-finished beef burger that comes from a humanely killed uh, cow. That's just that's really? just the math, you know? I mean, and that's the math of base, based on what we can measure with our physical experience and also based on our scientific experience of, of all kinds of historical data on showing uh, levels of hormones and, and amino acids and, and tumors and all that kind of stuff going on within our physical bodies. So that's at least where I'm standing on it right at the moment as I'm a, I'm a carnivore, uh, you know, and, and I eat, I eat everything. I eat, I eat vegetables, I eat fruit, I eat fish, I eat, uh, meat, you know, I mean, I, I go based on my intuition. I go based on some data that I get on the bigger fish and kind of minimize that. Um, to get the omega threes to have a good ratios between omega threes and sixes and and such, excuse me. And um, but yeah, a lot of it comes from intuition. Yep. And dude, the last thing I would say is you can look at this, you know, two ways. And anyone who thinks that they're sparing the earth by not eating a large animal. The system relies on that one. I think we've all kind of determined that the smaller, the bigger things eat the smaller things, and then the big thing dies and it feeds the smaller things, right? Uh, and then someone will take a very ethical animal welfare position and say, well, I'm not going to eat the animals anymore. I'm only going to eat the small things. I'm going to spare that animal's life. Okay. But by breaking that link, in the system, you're really just shortchanging it as it comes back around because that animal not dying didn't feed the earth, then didn't feed you who will feed the earth. And now you're shortchanging that plant to grow who's going to shortchange that animal who eats that plant. By stopping at something that happens, you're not, maybe it feels like you're doing good today, but from a, maybe it's a population standpoint, you're actually doing more harm than good. And it's been seen time and time again in, in Alaska, they are open about the killing of predators. You're allowed to shoot grizzly bears and wolves and, and all these animals. And people think, oh, you, these horrible, you know, people, these monsters are killing bear cubs. And, but Alaska has massive game, uh, big game populations, caribou, elk, deer, because they control predators. Uh, and, here, you know, in the lower 48, we don't do that. And we have horrible, horrible numbers. And people say, and you could play, zoom out and play the long game. You could say, well, you know, what? we're not going to control uh, mountain lions, for example. And what they'll do is they'll just eat all the deer until there's not enough left for them to survive. And then their numbers will naturally die down. And then the deer can kind of rise back up. But if we can kind of intervene and control them all on a, on a higher level, um, I think we can all have deer and mountain lions all the time, uh, which seems to be a, a good way to look at it. So that's my rant. Um, I mean, I'm Sorry still going to eat big here. animals. As a, as a someone who doesn't like killing things, I'm still going to do it because 
It's the way it is, in my opinion. Hold on one sec. So, you know, and one one more thought that I want to just uh, bring up into this conversation is that, and the same thing goes for humans. Sometimes the alternative of, of not dying and, and staying alive is not as good as perhaps yeah. as, as dying. You know, it, it, as you're saying, if, if perhaps an animal is, is just getting older and weaker and does not have something to feed on, or um, in another scenario, it's being eaten alive by a, a pack of coyotes in a very traumatic experience rather than, uh, you know, having a nice life on the farm with uh, classical music and a and, and nice Kobe beef, whatever we're talking yeah. about. Sure. Um, I'm, I'm just, you know, bringing up some ideas. But anyways, you know, taking his life very quickly and humanely uh, in a way, perhaps in their sleep, as we've heard about, uh, is, is that deer or is that elk in, in Hawaii? Did they, you know, they kill them during their sleep with a, with a silencer, you know, from like snipers. They do this not during their uh, sleep. They just do it at night. At night. Okay. It's easier to kill, uh, kill animals like that at night than it is during the day. It's illegal in most places, but since the axis deer are invasive in, uh, Lanai, they are, they have made it legal mm -hmm. to shoot them at night with a silencer. Gotcha. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just a, a point of contemplation again of, of what is the alternative, you know, um, of, of a lot of times, you know, people that are alive and they're suffering and, uh, there's all kinds of rules I know about, about, um, humans who perhaps want to take the decision whether to take their own lives or, um, assist their parents or whatnot, who are suffering big time in a coma or whatnot. Um, and I know there's all kinds of, you know, contracts that people can sign in advance or when they're admitted into a hospital or once or hospice, whatever, uh, you know, I don't know much about it. I just think about the idea that sometimes the reality in a certain body or reality in a certain environment may not be as good as the reality of that, uh, soul or conscious being, um, in the next iteration. Sure. So, and dude, a, a dying in the animal, in the wild as a, as an animal elk do not die in a good way ever. Their teeth are going to, they're going to get old. Their teeth are going to wear down and they're going to starve to death or yeah. Or they're going to get eaten slowly by a couple of predators, you know, over the course of minutes and hours, uh, where I'm sure they would gladly rather trade a, uh, an arrow double lunging them and it being over in, you know, a matter of seconds. Mm -hmm. Uh, but again, it's not for everyone. I, I I'm not, I'm not going to promote it either way, but. I do think that there's a, you know, a little bit of a disconnect there as to how people view hunting and eating big yeah. animals. Yeah, and to just yeah, you can bring that point again. That's that's where we are right now. That's what we think about right now, and this is why we're having these conversations um, to continue exploring these topics and, and educate one another and uh, hear from you guys. Uh, if anybody has any any want to share their perspective. Please share it in the comments on YouTube or, you know, reach out to us um, on other platforms. We will uh, bring more avenues for, for you to reach out and give us your suggestions or perspective. And we will uh, be discussing and thinking about that. So uh, we are open-minded and open-hearted. So I think that's uh, where we'll wrap it up. Yeah, that's good. We both have uh, places to run, I think. All right. Thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing uh, all this knowledge, info, perspective. It's been, oh, a, yes. it's been uh, a joy and a pleasure as usual. And uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. And uh, we'll see you in the next episode. Yeah. The book, again, is Raising Outdoor Kids in an Indoor World, I think the title is, by Steve okay. Rinello. I, I, was, I will show that in the notes. And then um, for now, all the episodes will be hosted on my website. So this will be on yonihavana.com slash SO, standing for uh, Seeking Optimization 16. So yonihavana.com slash SO 16. See you in the next one. Beautiful. Thanks, Doc.